I'm Shan Creighton. I'm the currently serving as the General Secretary at the American Friends Service Committee, and I'm a recovering academic. So it was my idea that we should have an academic symposium as part of this event, uh, really to try to draw in uh, young researchers and old uh, into the notion of doing research that really makes a difference and having us uh, who are involved in trying to implement some of those ideas able to, to share and exchange. Uh, so this has worked out really beautifully. And uh, I now have the, the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for this event. And uh, I want to say that uh, many years ago, I came across a book by Lewis Fry Richardson, written, published actually post posthumously, but a book that he had written in the 1940s and 50s called Statistics of Deadly Quarrels. And uh, he was a mathematician and a Quaker um, and did some uh, probabilistic forecasting of weather. But he got interested in the notion of trying to understand what caused deadly quarrels, wars, and even murders, a kind of deadly quarrel. And he collected all of the wars from about 1920 to 1950 and all kinds of information on them. And he became the father of quantitative political science. So in late 2012, when I heard about a book that had just come out called Why Civil Resistance Works, and I heard that this book was going to analyze efforts to overthrow uh, tyrannical regimes and end occupations, and it was going to use statistical methods, I was thrilled. Um, I actually am a former professor of biostatistics somewhere in my deep past. Um, when I got the book, I was even more thrilled to see that not only was there this wonderful, rigorous, quantitative analysis of civil resistance as an alternative to violence, but it was paired up with a wonderful qualitative look at why the results of that quantitative analysis might have come about. It was a wonderful teamwork of Maria Stefan, who you just saw up on the last panel, and our keynote speaker, Erica Chenoweth. So this has really been a, a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful guide for many of us working in this field, and I'm really looking forward to what Erica's going to tell us today. Well, thank you so much, Shan. Um, it's such an honor to be around a group like this. Every time I get to spend time with a group like this, I leave inspired, hopeful, and challenged to bring a more just and peaceful vision to all of my work and my service. Um, I also want to thank you for the focus on research and scholarship and science. Um, at a time when the truth, fact, and science concepts are under assault, it's refreshing to find spaces where people are actually doubling down on their commitments to these important practices and principles. And I also want to uh, thank AFSC in particular for your leadership and support of the sanctuary movement, which has um, a lot of impact on me um, and my community. Um, when uh, things started to heat up around uh, deportations in the last few weeks in Denver, where I live, um, you know, I, I, I was called to try to support the people in my community who are the most affected. And uh, when I asked around it who was really organizing the efforts and supporting uh, the people who were asking for help, of course, it was hard to find the answer because not only does AFSC do a lot of that, but they don't really want a lot of credit for it. And, um, and so I've been very humbled and, and absolutely thrilled to become more connected. Um, with your wonderful organization through that work. And I just want to thank you personally because it's helping my friends. So what I wanted to talk about tonight is first uh, the bad news. Um, there is some. You may be familiar with some of it <laughs> at this point. But I'm going to walk uh, us through a couple of things that a lot of my political science colleagues and I are paying particular attention to and have been paying attention to for the past decade in laying out some global trends that help us to put into context the situations in which we find ourselves today in the United States, 
um, and to think about them in terms of global problems. Um, and then what I'm going to do is lay out the reasons why I'm still optimistic um, and in some ways increasingly optimistic every day uh, as I watch what's taking place around the world and in this country in particular. So uh, let me start with item of bad news number one. And I'm going to talk about three really bad news items, but they're all interrelated, and that's important. These are interrelated trends of war, economic inequality, racism, and the contraction of political freedom around the world. And they go together. So uh, bad news item number one is that up until 2011, war was on the decline. There had been no major power wars, that is, between great powers since uh, World War II. Uh, there was a decline in the number of wars between countries, um, and that was an increasing trend over time. So we virtually saw almost no active armed confrontations between states. Um, and we were starting to even see the decline of intrastate war, that is, war within states. Um, particularly after the end of the 1990s and early 2000s when a lot of the, um, the uh, conflicts of the post-Soviet space started to shake out a little bit. Um, but the bad news is that since 2011, uh, violent conflicts have been on the rise. And that's both true in terms of the intrastate war, uh, that is civil wars. Uh, in interstate war, we've had an, an active annexation uh, by a, one country of another's territory, that is Russia uh, annexing uh, Crimea. Um, and uh, we've seen a lot of heightened tensions, um, in including between major powers and including between nuclear armed major powers, of uh, the likes that we haven't seen since um, major crises that many books have been written about uh, from the early 1960s. Um, an important book helps us to understand the ways in which this increase in violent conflict can be understood through understanding the way that demography and economic inequality have kind of a deadly mix when they overlap with racial and ethnic inequalities. This important book is by my colleagues Lars Eric Sederman, Christian Gledich, and Hovard Buhag. It won an award. It's an excellent uh, book. And what it does is it analyzes all of the civil wars around the world from 1945 through 2011. And they take on a very important conventional wisdom um, that has long endured in political science that the primary cause of civil war is poverty. And in fact, this particular correlation has been so dominant in my field that it has informed policy and helps to understand why so many development programs um, became so well-funded um, in the 1990s and so forth, because there was an understanding that if you uh, lift up people out of poverty, that you'll also uh, lower the, the propensity for civil war. This book takes on that finding and actually critiques it by saying that it's not actually poverty or wealth that explains whether a country has civil war or not. It's what they call horizontal inequalities which is when economic inequalities are linked to racial or ethnic difference. So in other words, if there are whites in a country that constitute the majority, and there are black people who constitute a minority, and there are economic inequalities that differentiate those populations, civil wars become much more likely to occur when those inequalities start to shift or the demography starts to shift. That is when the population size of the majority starts to shrink and the population size of the minority starts to expand. And they argue that this particular trend helps to explain all kinds of different civil wars, including those that were in fact um, often um, not commonly associated with ethnicity per se, but were more associated with political deprivations and so forth. So this is a very important book because um, it makes an important prediction, which is that demographic changes, especially sudden ones, which threaten the perceived privileges of majorities in the population, are likely to um, become uh, heated, violent confrontations. Now, the second trend that is related 
is the way that civil wars force people to flee. And the people that are forced to flee during civil wars are often the people who um, belong in uh, marginalized communities or already quite vulnerable and either have to move around within the country or they have to leave the country. And so um, you're probably familiar with many of the different claims about the rise of displaced populations that we're now dealing with and how they're the largest uh, number around the world since World War II. Of course, um, much of the, uh, the crisis in refugees and displaced persons is directly the result of civil wars um, in various countries. Um, and this actually exacerbates those demographic shifts that can be very sudden and provoke reactions um, within populations living in their, their home area. So France, for example, right now, facing a super important election coming up here in the next couple of days, is a perfect example of how um, population flows kind of exacerbate underlying tensions and inequalities in societies uh, in ways that really polarize along both class and racial or ethnic lines. The third element of bad news um, comes from the observation that democracy as a form of government was spreading up until basically 2003. Um, and now it is declining around the world. So uh, this would be a little maybe less troubling if many of the democracies that were kind of failing uh, were failing, uh, that, that were, they were sort of expected to be difficult roads. So places that were emerging from really difficult conflicts or where it was clear that people weren't making the proper investments and in supporting um, a transition or consolidation. But this is happening in established, advanced democracies. Places like Poland, Hungary, um, and then in other emerging places like uh, Turkey and Brazil, Venezuela, um, some would argue the United States, some would argue France. And, um, you know, part of the, the reason why we're seeing the decline in democracy um, is associated, and it's not sure that this is causing it, but that there's a characteristic of this decline that is linking all of these countries around the globe, which is that these democracies are collapsing under the force of elected governments, elected governments that put forth nativist or sort of right-wing reactionary populist policies. Um, they tend to reject whatever establishment there is in the country. They just want everybody out um, without thinking through what they want as a replacement. And this is bad news because um, whether we like democracy or not, as Winston Churchill said, it's the worst form of government except for all the others that we've tried. Um, it's a necessary and insufficient condition to address economic, social, and political injustices. Bad things happen in them, um, but my sense is it's too soon to abandon the democratic experiment. Um, democracies don't fight each other as, war, as interstate wars. There's also something political scientists observe called the domestic democratic peace, which means that democracies don't tend to slaughter their own civilians, at least modern democracies don't. They have better human rights practices. Democracy itself is a form of nonviolent conflict resolution. Um, and uh, so even though we haven't got it right yet, um, we probably shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So believe it or not, um, many people in my field in political science have long understood the march toward democracy, especially liberal democracy, as an inevitability. Something that we don't even really have to work for, it's just gonna happen because everybody's just gonna understand that democracy is the best and they're gonna want to aspire toward it and they're gonna fight for it. And uh, there, this was expressed in an important book by Frank Fukuyama back in 1990 called The End of History and the Last Man. It was a very triumphalist uh, tome about um, why the Soviet Union had failed and why everybody's gonna wanna be like the United States. Um, and there weren't as many political scientists, believe it or not, who were paying attention to the notion that maybe this wasn't a permanent trend. Maybe people um, were celebrating too soon. Um, maybe democracy isn't actually all that great for a lot of people living in those democracies and they need to be constantly improved. 
um, rather than just taken for granted. But there are two political scientists, three really, um, who um, wrote a book, wrote two books. Um, one is called Dilemmas of Democratic Consolidation, uh, Game Theory Approach. Only read it if you're into game theory or know what that is. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'll just tell you what it says. It says, it says that um, democratic consolidation only occurs after mass protests um, and never occurs without them. Um, and then this other book written just now, uh, just published by Steph Haggard and Bob Kaufman called Dictators and Democrats. What they do is they take every case in the world of democratic breakthrough, that's when an authoritarian regime becomes a democracy, and every case of um, authoritarian breakthrough, which is when a democracy collapses and becomes, slides back into authoritarianism. And they ask what happened in these societies especially when there was that backsliding. They look at 78 cases, and they basically argue that that happens, authoritarian backsliding, when people become disengaged from politics. And this is the more chilling part and the scarier part. Once the slide starts, our institutions cannot save us, meaning our elections, our legislatures, our laws, our courts are no longer reliable as bastions against authoritarian collapse. They argue that the only cases in which a backsliding into authoritarianism was halted and reversed back toward democracy were cases where civil society openly and overtly and robustly resisted the slide and in fact rebuilt or modified or corrected the institutions in extremely important ways. Nonviolently, by the way. So, why is this? Well, to lay the groundwork for this, I want to take us back to the early 1990s, when a Harvard professor named Robert Putnam went uh, on an NSF grant to Italy to study for two years in Tuscany in a villa. Now, they don't pay us for this anymore, just so you know. <laughs> That gravy train ended a long time ago, <laughs> maybe in part because of Bob. But anyway, what he wanted to do is study uh, the reason why Italian democracy seemed to function so well in the North and so poorly in the South. And this is a really nice um, example of a comparative case because you can look within the same country at different outcomes in democratic quality. So what, he, what, what was going on in the North is that um, politicians tend to be much more responsive to their constituents or much more engaged. And so there was a much better public service function and you know, people were getting more or less satisfied with the political order. And then in the South, um, politicians were super disengaged from their constituents, elected officials. Um, public service provision, terrible. Lots of corruption, lots of perception that politicians don't work for us um, and this is not a very effective government. So he wanted to know why, and in his multiple years of study, he came up with this argument and this concept that he calls social capital. And it turns out that social capital, which was people's personal investments in civil society, um, was much stronger in the North than in the South. And what do those personal investments look like? They're things like, how many newspapers does each household subscribe to? How many magazines? How many civic organizations are they card-holding members of? Do they belong to unions? Um, do they have arguments with their neighbors over dinner about politics? Um, do they do extramural sports? And what he did was he counted, actually, and gave an index in these different households for how many of these different types of civic activities dominated the lives of these people in northern Italy. And uh, he compared them with the South, where basically, um, people didn't subscribe to newspapers or magazines. Uh, they did not engage in a lot of different civic activities except maybe through their church. Um, and the most organized and effective social capital entity in the South was the mafia, which nobody really wanted to uh, voluntarily cooperate with. So as a result, people were quite disengaged from politics, and he argues that that is really the critical difference. And when people feel like they have the skills to sit around a dinner table with people with whom they disagree about politics and try to bang out some common ground, 
Um, and they're going to be really informed, and they're going to read all the papers, and they're going to know exactly whether those politicians are being held accountable to their promises. You're going to have politicians who are actually scared of their constituents and who want to do what they said they were going to do. Um, whereas when there's impunity for uh, derogating your duty, um, then you can get away with all kinds of corruption. So he argues that social capital has all of these benefits, um, both for the, the health of a civil society and the health of the democratic functioning of its institutions. They include things like reciprocity, a sense of duty, a sense of participation, a sense of responsibility for one's own order. So then he comes back to the United States and he thought, I wonder how we're doing here in the US. I wonder how the, what the, the, if I measure all this, uh, these different indicators here in the United States, how are we doing? And the answer was not so good. And he wrote a book in 2000 called Bowling Alone. Maybe you've heard of that one instead of the academic making democracy work. In Bowling Alone, he argues that um, it, you know, it's a clever title based on one of the indicators, membership in league, uh, league bowling. <laughs> Um, not saying we should all do it, although that would be fun, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> if we all went out tonight, <laughs> or just set it up in the back. And, um, but, uh, but basically, he argues that you know, the, the, the membership in bowling uh, clubs is indicative of broader trends in the decline of membership in different types of civic associations. That could be church groups, it could be uh, neighborhood clubs, it could be sports, it, extramural sports of any kind, newspaper subscriptions, magazine subscriptions people sitting on their front porch, you know, and knowing their neighbors' names. Things like this um, were much more common up until about the 1960s, and then have basically had a linear slide down since then. So um, what I want to say about this is that it is disheartening as a trend, um, but there is a lot of good news. Um, as this country goes today, if we take a look at these very important indicators uh, and we understand what's going on also around the world that we're part of. So the first thing I want to say is that people are resisting. The second thing I want to say is that the new resistance campaigns that emerge are overwhelmingly nonviolent. The third thing I want to say is that nonviolent resistance has proved over time to be a far more effective and less costly technique for producing political change. And the fourth thing I want to say is that unlike many of our predecessors who wage struggle by the seat of their pants, we have the benefit of all of their collective experience. And we have it documented all over the place, um, including, I suspect, in some of AFSC's archives, which I got to admit, after listening to a lot of these papers today, I just kind of want to go and hang out there for a few weeks <laughs> and read about everything. Um, but, um, but we live in a time where we have more access to written, recorded, videotaped, audio taped, um, all different types of materials on how to wage nonviolent struggle than anybody has ever had before us. And um, research, scholarship, knowledge that we have accumulated over the decades puts us in a fantastically uh, advantageous position uh, to protect what's working and to fix what isn't. I also just want to take this moment to mention a couple of the people that have str like strongly influenced my own thinking on these things, including Stephen Zunas, who you heard just now, Peter Ackerman, Gene Sharp, George, Lakey. Um, Howard Clark, Mary King, there are so many other people, David Hartso here, there are so many people um, who have written and documented their histories um, that we can learn from. We're extremely lucky for that. So first let me establish this trend that people are resisting. Now this is data um, that I've collected from 1900 through the end of 2015 called the Major Episodes of Data Project. And these data only look at mass campaigns to either overthrow a dictator or create territorial independence through kicking out a foreign military occupation, a colonial power, or through secession. And uh, those are what you might call maximalist campaigns. And what we can see here is that there has been an important substitution that took place after basically the end of the colonial era in the 70s, where violent uprisings of, this, of the, these categories started to decline in their frequency, 
and nonviolent campaigns, people power movements, started to replace them as the modal form of popular uh, contestation. And in fact, um, if we updated these data through today, we would see that our current decade, just seven years in, has already overtaken our prior decade and the onset of new mass nonviolent uprisings. So we live in the most contentious nonviolent time recorded at least since 1900, and I suspect before that. You might be feeling that um, when, you, when you look around the world today. The second bit about this is that these nonviolent campaigns have had an overwhelmingly superior record in succeeding outright, that is, removing the dictator or creating territorial independence, compared to these violent counterparts from prior days. Um, and one of the things to note is that there is quite a lot of variation by decade in the efficacy of nonviolent and violent resistance. And even though the absolute um, success rates of nonviolent resistance have declined since 2010, according to this chart, um, their relative effectiveness is still far superior uh, to that of violent resistance. So I want to talk a little bit about what some of our collected work, current work, uh, says on what makes nonviolent movements effective. The first is that um, they build and sustain large and diverse participation bases. The second is that they tend to use a variety of different methods of nonviolent action. The third thing that takes place is that they tend to elicit shifts in the loyalty of the different pillars of support that um, the current status quo relies upon. And then the fourth thing they do is they tend to maintain discipline uh, when the opponent begins to escalate repression. So I'm gonna walk through these fairly quickly just to establish the empirical basis of these claims. The first one is that um, popular participation which needs to be diverse if it's gonna get large anyway, uh, is absolutely one of the single most important things that any mass movement has to do to succeed. Um, it turns out that above a certain threshold of popular participation, we didn't see any movements fail between 1900 and 2006. That threshold was 3.5% of the population. Um, and there's a, a grad student actually at MIT named Steve Whittles who's modified this claim just slightly, and I'll throw it out there because I think it's an important point. He argues that participation in and of itself, that is just assembling huge numbers of people in one place, is not sufficient for success. <coughs> it's not just mass, but it's well-organized mass. And what he, what he bases this claim on is his finding that he, he took uh, our data and he recoded the data to indicate whether the leadership of the movement um, had a labor organization or a religious organization or faith-based organization or both um, at the helm. And he found that that is a really critical indicator of whether a movement ends up succeeding or not. So in other words, it's, and that's a proxy for organization, organizational skill, but I also think it's a good proxy for what George was talking about this morning when he was talking about how vision is what really activates people and motivates them to participate over the long haul. And it's often the case that these types of organizations and institutions have a large degree of capacity, both for mobilizing people and training them and preparing them for what's ahead, but also to give them some kind of moral vision that they can hang on to, that maybe uh, less organized movements don't have the benefit of. So um, the second thing uh, that I mentioned is this ability to create loyalty shifts within the opponent's pillars of support. And basically this is um, coming from an insight that Gene Sharp and Hannah Arendt uh, and others had established that basically any power holder, no, no matter how tyrannical, can't do anything without the cooperation, obedience, and help of people that are implementing their wishes. And it's those people um, that are sort of the, coerc the coercive target of civil resistance. Meaning, um, you know, the people that push the paper, the civilian bureaucrats, or the people that actually carry out orders to repress, are our friends and neighbors. They live in the same places that, uh, that many of us live, and we have direct access to them, we have personal relationships with them. And the argument, the real theory of change here for, for, for this particular approach to nonviolent resistance is an understanding that their political calculus can be changed 
um, given changes in kind of popular sentiment. So for example, um, one, of, one of the most clarifying examples of this came from the Serbian uprising, which has been mentioned a couple times today, um, when hundreds of thousands of people descended on Belgrade in October of 2000 to um, de demand that Slobodan Milosevic vacate office after fraudulent elections. And security forces were actually ordered to shoot on these demonstrators with black fire and they refused to do so. And the demonstrators heard it because they had a stolen radio and they could hear the order come and they could see that the police were not following the order. And so at that moment they knew that the game was over. And many journalists and academics rushed to the scene to ask these people why they didn't shoot <laughs> because this was fascinating. And um, they got these really fascinating answers, things like, I saw my kid in the crowd or I saw my next door neighbor or my wife's brother or the guy who sells me liquor at a discount on Saturdays, and I didn't want to, you know, lose my liquor on Saturdays <laughs> discount. Um, and so these are incredibly mundane personal explanations. <coughs> mundane personal explanations for political behavior explain basically all political behavior. <laughs> um, and this is true no matter who you're talking about. Those, those power holders, the people that, that want to do um, the, the, the oppressive thing, they can't do that unless they have these people's cooperation. And a lot of times these people's cooperation can be contested at key moments, especially the larger and more diverse the population is that's um, contesting it. So of course sometimes they do shoot. Um, in fact, 90% of the campaigns that are in this data set through 2015 lethal repression from the government. So of course it is the case that usually these campaigns endure for years under quite severe repression, and then there's a moment of defection or loyalty shift at the end that leads them to succeed. Um, but it is still the case that um, the nonviolent mass campaigns that we studied had a two to one advantage over their violent counterparts even when this lethal repression took place. And we think that there are two main reasons for this. The first is a backfire effect, which Lee Smithy here is uh, writing a book on uh, that everybody should check out very soon, um, which basically is the process that takes place when the aim of the repression um, doesn't come to pass because the repression itself creates more outrage. <laughs> so this would be like the example of um, up here, I have the picture of Emmett Till's mother over his um, open casket. Um, and then in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a picture of a, actually it turns out to be a fake colonel, um, a, a protester dressed as a colonel pretending to be a defector um, in the Egyptian army. But uh, nevertheless, he sold the entire world media um, that he was in fact an Egyptian colonel. Um, but it, it simply um, goes to show that uh, sometimes incidents of repression can create outrage, moral outrage, that then bring more people out into the fray. Um, for me, I think one of the more important uh, dynamics that can take place, though, is that a well-organized um, and skillful deployment of nonviolent tactics can really expand the cost of repression and make it unsustainable. So the more people that participate, the more costly it is to continue repressing. And this is especially true uh, when the movement takes care to shift methods so that they're not always protesting, um, but sometimes they're staying at home on a day when they said they were going to be protesting, like in this lower right hand or upper right hand corner. Um, in this photo, which is the type of photo you never see on the news because nobody knows what they're looking at, um, you see that there was a protest announced um, as a mass demonstration. And so all these riot police came out, presumably they're being paid overtime, standing out in the sun, and nobody showed up except for them. So they're standing around super bored. I mean, this has got to be the most boring day ever for them, right? Um, and meantime, uh, nobody's getting hurt. None of the protesters are getting hurt because they shifted the technique um, to inoculate themselves against repression when it started to get too dangerous. So um, the last thing I mentioned is, is this process of sticking uh, to a discipline plan um, when repression becomes bad. And um, this is basically the, the argument that, um, that Gene Sharp has made before and others have made that, that um, you know, movements can basically prepare, train, um, and come up with strategies to uh, 
um, to stick to their plan, even when the opponent starts to escalate repression, which they do deliberately to provoke the movement into disarray or violence. Um, getting them to those two outcomes, chaos and disarray, or violence is exactly what works best for the state that's opposing them, because they have the clear advantage um, in either of those two domains. Chaos and disarray just repels people from participating because it looks chaotic, and humans try to avoid chaos. Um, and it makes the state look legitimate because it's trying to reestablish order. Um, and then violence helps the state because then it can completely go full bore into its propaganda that these are terrorists and they're criminals and they're, you know, any other kind of word that they might use um, to undermine the legitimacy of these campaigns. And so we do find, in fact, in, in a study that I've done with Kurt Schock, that nonviolent campaigns um, that maintain nonviolent discipline in the face of repression are, have a higher rate of success than nonviolent campaigns that start to mix methods and use violence alongside nonviolent action or those that turn to violence altogether. Um, and the reason is, uh, first of all, that um, mixing tactics um, that are both nonviolent and violent tends to suppress popular participation. Um, we could estimate a 17% reduction in the number of people that um, were participating in, in peak events. Um, and it also tends to repel potential allies or third party supporters in ways that reduce the probability that these campaigns will effectively get those defections that are so necessary from security forces or civilian bureaucrats or the state media or others that they're trying to kind of work on politically. Um, and then the other thing that happens is there's a longer term risk, um, which is to say that um, violent flanks alongside nonviolent movements tend to predispose societies to higher risks of having a civil war within a decade. Um, and they also reduce the possibility that the country will emerge afterward as a democracy. So in wrapping up, I, I wanna say a couple things in sum. The, the first is that, as I mentioned, I'm optimistic uh, right now. And the reason is because um, people are fighting back uh, the Women's March, I mean, we, we've had many different movements around this country um, for decade, and for the entire country's founding. Before the country was founded, um, there was a decade of civil disobedience um, before the Revolutionary War that many people don't talk about. <laughs> um, but even in, in recent decades, we've had the anti-nuclear movement, um, we've had the Civil Rights Movement, we've had ACT UP, we've had Climate Action, we've had the Dreamers, we've had Standing Rock, we've had the Movement for Black Lives. We have an incredible wealth of experience in this country uh, with civic mobilization, with grassroots organizing, and with nonviolent resistance. Um, the Women's March on January 21st was important. Um, uh, critique it if you want, but it was uh, the day that the United States had the most people engaged in active civil disobedience um, that we've ever recorded. That is not counting, you know, sit in, you know, not counting teach-ins and stuff, but like people in the streets. I counted it. There were uh, between 4.2 and 6 million people in the streets at the Women's March in the streets or in their nursing homes wanting to be in the streets. I got, I got an awful lot of emails like that too, of, of people that were in solidarity and couldn't be there. And, and this was the most activated in my lifetime that I've ever seen um, the United States population. And it didn't stop with that. We've had um, the, as far as I could tell, quite improvised mobilization in airports um, against uh, the Muslim ban. Um, we've had incredibly uh, swift mobilization to try to uh, support undocumented people um, who've asked for help um, in the sanctuary movement. We've got the science march tomorrow. We had the tax march last week. We had the day without a woman. We had a day without an immigrant. I've been counting them all, <laughs> okay? And, and, and there's millions of people who are resisting, and they're doing so nonviolently. Um, last month, there was an amazing event um, that took place in Dallas. There was a pro-Trump group um, that wanted to protest outside of a mosque in Dallas. And so they, they went and uh, they had a protest that was called Trump is your president. And they had red hats and they came with signs and it was sort of, you know, Islamophobic undertones. 
And the mosque um, had a counter protest and went out and stood with their signs and um, you know, tensions started to get high. Um, but then there was a, a third group that showed up, a group called the Dollar, Dallas Workers Front, and they came with sticks and guns and uh, started screaming at the pro-Trump people and starting to you know, swear at them and threaten them. And the, the members of the mosque actually came out and asked them to go away. This is not the vision that we want of this society, and this is not the way we want this protest to go down, because guess who's going to get it if you all start <laughs> doing this stuff? And the Dallas Workers Front refused to step off. So the members of the mosque and the members of the pro-Trump rally convened together, went to a restaurant called the Halal Guys Restaurant, <laughs> and sat down and had a meal together and tried to talk it out. So. The, I, don't, I don't know what came of the event, but I know that that happened. It's in the crowd counting database. It's an incredible example of um, people, people wanting to be united, even knowing that they're quite polarized, they're working from different fact bases and everything else. So my sense is that we are rebuilding the civil society we need to move forward, and it's gonna be a long process. It's not gonna happen overnight. There will be setbacks as well as uh, victories and gains. But one thing we know from, from the literature on mobilization and activism is this great concept called cognitive activation, which is that the more people engage in this type of mobilization, the more they see the things that they're mobilizing about. <laughs> um, this is a, a finding that was developed by um, a colleague, Chris Davenport, um, who studied untouchability among 98,000 people in India, he did surveys. It turned out that the people who were engaged in civic activity around untouchability and discrimination against untouchables, they were more likely after they started to participate to see discrimination and to know it when they saw it. And so get this, like half of the people that showed up at the Women's March, it was like their first thing ever that they'd done, right? Lots of newcomers and first timers. And now guess what they see everywhere? <laughs> they see patriarchy everywhere. It's very exciting. Um, so so um, I'm, I'm with George. I think uh, this is a time when we can be extremely optimistic precisely because of kind of the political chaos of our time um, that we can organize and we create the communities that we want right now. We just do it without asking permission. We just go ahead and do it. Um, and um, I'll just close by you know, bringing it back to the scientific uh, possibilities that were mentioned in the previous panel. So Thomas Kuhn has this book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, um, where he talks about how paradigm shifts, like from the Copernican universe to the Galilean universe, um, happen because, not just because Copernicus failed, <laughs> but because Galileo brought out a new alternative that worked. And so we're in a space right now that I do think, you know, these problems of economic injustice, racial injustice, patriarchy, um, and the lack of fair and functional political systems, we need alternatives to these things. The stuff that we've been doing hasn't been working. That's why we are where we are. Um, and we can't have this sort of sustained nonviolent future until we do find and express alternatives that actually meet um, the, the critiques that are being put forward. Um, in a way that, that suits as many people as possible. Um, so with that, I think I'll just say thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to hearing all your comments. We have time for some questions uh, before we go, so let's uh, see. I, I see a question over here. Um, we got microphones coming. And Hi, Erica, thanks so much. Bridget Moikes from Washington, DC. Um, great talk, very inspiring. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the importance of the Women's March and um, what has continued from that. My um, concern is, how is the sustaining part? And I wanna ask what recommendations, you know enough about AFSC, I think, and Quaker work um, and about what sustains and what succeeds from all of your work, you know, what are your recommendations to AFSC about the specific innovations or specific role we should be playing 
and you can say anything except just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Would you like to take a couple of questions? Yeah, that would be yeah, good. Let's get a couple more questions and then we'll let Erica have time to think about that. Uh, I see a question in the back here. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, first of all, we need a bibliography, um, so if you can uh, publish that would be great. Um, put it online or post it somewhere. Um, but my question has to do with uh, sort of along the same lines, um, but where do you see some of the movements that are underway linking with each other? So Black Lives Matter with women's movement, with uh, the immigration folks, with those to really build a, a grand coalition or something that's bigger than each of us trying to struggle and, uh, alone on these issues. And, and do you see that happening and, and where is the impetus coming for that? And maybe that's what AFSC could be doing, I don't know. But it, um, comment on that would be great. I saw a hand over here and uh, we'll try to get one over here too. So if you're gonna see where we can go. We'll so my question is, um, how do you categorize these movements into success and failure? That seems like incredibly difficult tricky work and also very basic to then build all of these other conclusions on. And we have one here and then in the row behind. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the, a book by Lazar Saderman, but I didn't catch the name of the book. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. I have a young student from Turkey who's feeling very, very discouraged about what's happening in his country. He's here studying English. What, what words of advice would you have for him? So there are lots of other hands, but let's let Erica take a shot at this and we may have to let her uh, email you later. Great, so first to Bridget, thanks for your question. Um, so one thing to note first is that um, from the data that I presented, um, the average campaign takes about three years to run its course. And so um, it's a years long process and that's once mobilization has begun. So that doesn't count all of the preparation and organizing that went into kind of the groundwork for movement mobilization. Um, so at a minimum, we're looking at a years long process. And so it's a great question, what sustains? Um, so I think uh, that's, that's a, a, a question that I haven't myself delved into the literature about, but I can give you my thoughts, just impression, you know, based on my impressions of, of the, the literature. Um, the first thing is that uh, there certainly has to be a very strong and committed core of people that are willing to put skin in the game the entire time um, and to sort of be the core organizers um, and connectors. Um, most of the time, we're not going to have, you know, 4.2 million people showing up um, unless it's, you know, one of these moments where the gravity of the situation speaks for itself. Most of the time, we're going to have, you know, a few hundred thousand, which is a lot, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, but the, the few hundred thousand that are showing up week after week um, in these political crowds that we're seeing um, can be further cultivated. Um, to make sure that they don't lose steam and that they get to have fun from time to time and they, they get to see their victories when they happen and so forth. Um, so in terms of what AFSC could do, um, I think part of it is, is um, you know, convening the different groups that it has access to, which I'm sure is going on. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, this relates to the second question, that there is this sense that there, there are lots of movements with tons of skills, with to overlapping interests, um, but that there isn't yet a real coalescence um, or even sense of trust at all among them about the fact that they can cooperate over the long term on big issues um, rather than just kind of short-term tactical issues. Um, and so to the extent that AFSC can lay, uh, uh, participate in laying out a foundation for a sustained dialogue, conversation, there are facilitation skills here that aren't necessarily had in, in other types of organizations. Um, there's co coalition building capacity here that isn't necessarily had elsewhere because AFSC has roots in so many different communities. 
Um, I think those are hugely important assets at a time like this that, um, that would need further cultivation and leverage. Um, and then in terms of just um, like what motivates people, what George said earlier, providing a vision. You know, if, if, there are, if there are Quaker economists that have their own um, association, I hope they're working on this, right? Like I hope they're, I hope they're coming up with a great alternative to capitalism. Um, okay, so um, the, the second question, I mean, who, who's, who's actually um, emerging as a movement of movements? Actually, last week there was an announcement um, of a kind of a grand coalition between a couple hundred different grassroots organizations. I'm not, I, I can't remember exactly what it was called, just the majority, is that what it was called? Anybody correct me? That's what it's called, yeah. It's called the majority. Um, if you Google the majority, uh, hopefully you'll find an article discussing it. But basically they came together and, and, and decided they were gonna start the conversation. And, and I think at this point, it's, it's quite normal um, for a movement of movements to be still trying to figure out what it's about and what the vision is that it can express in a common way, and that's just exactly where it should be. There, there should be like a bunch of different com competing claims right now, and people should be arguing about what comes first and who does what. That's just normal. And, um, and uh, the hope is for a long-term sustained movement that they'll be able to come to some agreement about it. But, um, but I, I think it's, it's not fair necessarily the critiques that go around about how much in disarray the progressive or radical left is, it's just exactly where it probably should be at this point in the movement life cycle. Um, the question about success and failure. The um, data, so some of the data that I showed relied on a, uh, an assessment of whether a campaign succeeded in either overthrowing a dictator, that is removing an incumbent leader from power through irregular means, or total territorial independence. So not just de facto independence or autonomy, but de jure legal independence as a sovereign state. And um, the assessment that we made um, was based on a couple of different indicators, that is whether the campaign itself, violent or nonviolent, had a discernible impact on that outcome, independent of other factors. Um, the second, that is to say that it wouldn't have happened without the campaign. Um, the second thing is that it had to have happened within a year of the peak of the campaign's mobilization. Um, and the third thing was that it had to pass a test of expert review where we sent around the data to different kind of field experts and, and they would write uh, whether they agreed with us about whether it was successful or failed. Um, and uh, that was for the NAVCO data and for the major episodes of contention data. Some of the other uh, work that's been done in this in this space looks more at what you might call process goals, which is measuring success based on a movement achieving important uh, goals that are sort of midstream to full success. So things like increasing popular participation, um, increasing public favorability of the movement and polls, that's like Omar Wassow's work, um, getting people uh, to change their voting behavior on the basis of the claims of the movement, that's also Wassow. Um, or in the case of labor strikes, which is the work by Hewitt Vaughn that I was citing, um, extracting concessions from um, different um, companies that people work for. So there are lots of different indicators out there of success, and when I say success, I'm usually referring to kind of different studies that use different indicators, but all have common findings at different levels of analysis. Um, the book by Lars Eric Saderman, Christian Gledich, and Hovard Bohog is called um, Grievances, Inequality, and Civil War. And I will put up a bibliography. Um, and then finally, what words for your student from Turkey? Um, first of all, I love Turkey. It's one of my favorite places in the world. I'm deeply saddened by what's been happening there. Um, and um, I'm not sure what to say other than um, we see you fighting there for the future of your country, and we're doing the same thing here. And so we're all together. I'm looking at the time, and uh, I think maybe we don't have time to take another round of questions at this point. But I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Erica, but also all of the panelists for inspiring us and helping us think of the things that we need to do and can do and will do uh, in order to reclaim 
our country and in order to reclaim a peace and a peaceful world. So um, one of my daughters asked me right after the election, what are we going to do now? And I said, I see a lot of arrests in my future. <laughs> <laughs>